stand with me for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Where I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. May God bless the reading of his word, and you guys may be seated. This morning, both first service at 9 and this service has asked two important questions. The first one this morning was, why the death of Christ? And to sum up, the first service was God's plan, God's purpose, and for God's praise. But God didn't just stop at his death, at providing peace between us and him, but instead proved his power in and through the resurrection. That is why when we read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, the second question we should ask is, why the resurrection? Why isn't Jesus still in a tomb? Why is it that we don't travel to Israel and to go see the site where Jesus is buried? That's an important question. It makes us different from any other quote-unquote religion in the rest of the world. You can go see Muhammad's grave. You can go see Buddha's grave. You can see all these great, you can see Joseph Smith's grave. You can see all these religious leaders in the world's graves. But Christ is the only one that's empty. It brings a validity to the message in which Paul said that I bring to you is of first importance. Coming from Southern California, being Southern California, Primo, numero uno, yeah, number one, the first one of all is that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the Christian message since the resurrection. The same message 12 men went to their deaths for. The same message that the early church fathers, also many of them, met their deaths to bring to people is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we focus on the resurrection and the big question of why, we're going to have four short answers for us this morning. As we ask the question, we have to answer the first in that is a sign from heaven. Your first fill in the blank this morning is a sign from heaven. As Jesus was walking and talking here on the earth, he did many miracles. He was always asked for signs and wonders. But there came a point in which even in his signs and wonders, people still did not believe. In fact, as Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees as they were complaining about this, he said that you were unable to believe, that you lack the power. Literally, the word he uses is dynamai, dunamai, we get the word dynamite from it. That you are without power to understand. It's not been, been given to you. And yet, they still continue to ask him for more signs. Finally, Jesus comes to a point in his ministry that we read in Matthew chapter 16. An evil and adulterous generation wants a sign. And so a sign will not be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. The sign of Jonah. Many of you may not know, but in the early church, and in fact in Israel, they just uncovered a whole group of tombs of early Christians. And what was engraved on their sarcophagi, the bone box, wasn't a cross. It was a fish. In the Greek, ichthus, the sign of Jonah 
some of them elaborate enough to actually show a fish and then a man telling the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale or the fish, depending on how you want to translate that. The very sign in which Jesus said is the last sign that he was going to give to these stubborn people that they've seen him feed 4,000 and 5,000. They have seen Lazarus raised from the dead. They've seen multitudes healed and are still yet unable and unwilling to believe. We see this story continue in John chapter 5. Do not be amazed at the miracles in which Christ was doing, for a time is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed bad deeds to a resurrection of judgment. The one thing that I think we often forget is that Jesus' resurrection provides a resurrection to all of humanity. But the big question is, is a resurrection unto what? Here it's clarified that all bodies will be raised, but some to everlasting judgment and some to everlasting life. Both are equal in that both are everlasting. That those, because God is both a righteous and just God, that punishment and reward have to be on equal scales. The evil do not just get annihilated and then justice is not done. Neither is it just reward, but instead both. The big question for many of us this morning is what resurrection are we going to partake in? Are we going to experience the resurrection unto life or the resurrection unto judgment? But the resurrection also validates God's plan. As we talked about this morning, it's God's plan, God's purpose to his glory. Jesus' resurrection, he not only foretold, but he fulfilled. Showing that he is 100% on par and above the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, Or of anyone claiming to be a prophet today. Who is it that has at, at any point in history been able to say that they are going to rise three days after they die? and actually accomplish it. In Mark chapter 8, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise from the dead. This is over a year and a half before these things are going to occur. Some would say even up to two years before his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And consistently it's saying he's continually teaching them of what is going to happen so that they're not surprised when it does. But unfortunately, we know the story. Were the disciples surprised? You betcha. Did they misunderstand or forget? Yeah, they did. But the amazing thing is, as Scripture records, that the Holy Spirit reminded them of all the things that Christ had told them, of the very fact that he would die and that he would raise again on the third day. That is why two of the disciples go running to the tomb to see if it is empty. In chapter 9, For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Once again, I think Jesus understood the the very nature of of mankind. God understands Chris, because Chris has a thick head. You have to tell Chris things quite a few times for it to really get through my head. And I've got to tell myself things many times to get it through my head. Here, Jesus understood his disciples and having to tell them again and again and again. In fact, the very next chapter in Mark 
and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. You should have been able to go up to any of the disciples and go, okay, what was it that Jesus told you? What was the thing he kept repeating? I'm wondering if they were going, which one, what, what exactly are you talking about? Because we see Peter forgetting. We see many of them running into hiding. Many of them, when the report of Jesus' resurrection comes, oh, no, 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 you just saw a ghost. That's not really him. So quick did they forget. But also, his resurrection shows victory over death. Because as Paul says later, if we really had the time this morning, we would go through all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul talks about the promise of the resurrection and the very fact that if Christ had not risen from the, the dead, that we are still in our sins and we are to be pitied above all other people. If somehow Christianity has lied for 2,000 years and Jesus is actually in some tomb somewhere in Israel, it's actually worse for us. That we are, as Paul says, to be pitied because we would believe in a lie. But instead, as we said this morning, that he is risen and that he has risen indeed. The evidence of Jesus' resurrection is converting many, even the so-called skeptics. Those that study history are continually dumbfounded with the evidence for the resurrection. The eyewitness testimony, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just after the verses that were read this morning, Paul makes sure to point out that there's 500 witnesses he could call to the stand that were still living that could give evidence to the fact that Christ had risen from the dead. According to Jewish law, they only need two. In many of our courts, we only need two, and yet there were 500 that they could continually have to the stand saying that we have seen the risen Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, but when the perishable puts on the imperishable and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about what is the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? It has been put away. It has been done. That if you are in Christ and your loved ones have been in Christ, when they pass away, when they go into the grave, we can have a hope beyond this life that we will see them again. That they will also be raised and that we will see them and we will know them. That is why death no longer has the sting it once had. That we have a hope that no one else in the world can have that type of hope except for in the completed work of God. But lastly, it's a promise that if the same Jesus who predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection and was actually resurrected says that there's a promise that comes with believing this. There's a promise that comes in the reality that he is now at the right hand of the Father and interceding on our behalf. This is a great promise of life and resurrection. In fact, one of the earliest discussions Jesus ever had with anybody on earth was about the resurrection and about life. We see Jesus and his disciples traveling. They ending, end up going through Samaria, the bad part of town. He stops for a drink of water. The disciples are going, why are we here in the first place? We should have gone around, you know, skipped the bad part of town. But Jesus had a purpose in stopping at that well that day. It was to have a conversation with a woman who needed to know about life and resurrection. In fact, in John chapter 6, oh, come on, 
think it's stuck. Uh, we'll stop there. I'll tell the story. Jesus stops, and a woman comes to come get her water as she normally would. And he asks for her to give him some of the water. Now, because of the cultural issues, they were in the bad part of town. She's wondering why the, this guy is asking her for a cup of water. And he explains to her that he could give her water that would quench her thirst. That he could give her life and life more abundantly. That he is the promised resurrection and the life. She asks, are, are you the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for? I am the one I am standing right before you. Oh, I know that the resurrection is going to come and that the eternity is coming. Jesus says to her, one of the most important words, that he is the resurrection and the life. And that all that enter into him will be raised to newness of life. We see this great promise reiterated again in John chapter 6. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of everything that he has given to me I will lose nothing, but to raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. That this morning, before we get to John chapter 10, do you have that promise of everlasting life? Do you have that promise of resurrection, not unto judgment, but unto life, and life more abundantly. That if you do, if the God has miraculously given you that gift of faith and repentance, Jesus says, I will lose none of them. But instead, I will raise them up. I will give them eternal life. I am the one who gives them resurrection that if we can trust that Christ said that that his promise is is that if you are in him let's fast forward to John chapter 10 getting ahead of myself the thief comes in to steal and to kill and to destroy but I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly Do you have that life and life more abundantly? Jesus in that same passage continues to say that those that the Father has given him are in his hands and none can take them out. And that those that are in his hands are also in the Father's hand and none can take them out of the Father's hands. The big question is, is whose hands are you in this morning? Are you in your own? Trusting in your own hands to work towards a resurrection? Or are they in Christ's? Are you like the woman at the well in whom Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. The important question this morning is why the resurrection, the resurrection is not only evidence of Jesus' promises, Jesus' claims, but is the, the stamp of approval of what he did. So that it shows that even death could not hold him. My question for you as we close this service, whose hands are you in? Who are you trusting? If you... Today, if the world were to suddenly end, would you receive resurrection unto life or resurrection unto judgment? Serious question this Easter, even though I'm wearing a nice bright blue vest.
a serious question that needs for all of us to answer. Are we in the hands of Jesus? Are we trusting in ourselves? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that your sign, your validation, your victory, and your promise give us hope this Easter. That we are not sitting, wondering, like the woman at the well, when the Messiah would come, when are these things going to happen? But instead, we can be like her, Lord. We can believe in the one who has come to take away the sin of the world. Lord, I would pray for those of us this morning that already know you and trust you, that we might be encouraged by these words, might be strengthened by the fact that no, no matter what life may bring, that we are yours, that we are in your hands for resurrection. Lord, even this morning, for those that have yet to believe, Lord, that you would draw them, that they might be those that have been given by the Father to the Son, that can trust in, in your words and saying that those that are in you, that you will raise them up on the last day and that you would give them life. Lord, may the Spirit move in the hearts of those that are here to ask these important questions. That they wouldn't leave here without asking, seeking, and finding the answers to those questions. Lord, now as we join with many of those, our brothers and sisters across the world, in giving you praise for what you have done, and in looking forward to what you will do, Together we will sing, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go and stand and sing.